Uh, good afternoon, everyone. CGCC members, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Peter Reisman. I'm the co-chair of the Government and Public Relations Committee for CGCC. I'm also managing director in charge of government relations and corporate communications for Bank of China USA. Very exciting to be here. And I would like to express a warm welcome and appreciation for everyone who's attending today's events. Uh, CGCC continues to serve its members by providing insightful webinars for business leaders from both China and the United States to express their opinions, exchange ideas, and explore opportunities for further cooperation. This is, of course, only the first stop uh, on a series of upcoming webinars titled The Path Forward. Uh, as many of you know, this is the seventh consecutive year that CGCC has conducted its annual business survey on Chinese enterprises in the United States. And I want to congratulate CGCC on another excellent survey report, which is well recognized and actually widely distributed um, both here in the United States uh, and in China. Uh, as, we, as we all know, this report comes at a critical time uh, when US-China relations is being challenged on various fronts. Uh, in terms such as decoupling, delisting, disengagement, have dominated recently in the media and in the halls of Capitol Hill. I'm sure those attending today's event uh, share my belief that today's dialogue and others similar in nature are both timely and critical in order to clarify the facts and much of the misinformation currently swarming the internet. While there is reason to be deeply concerned about the current state of business cooperation, the regulatory environment, and government and trade negotiations between the US and China, it is my belief that economic interdependence, integration, and engagement between the two largest economies in the world has brought and will continue to bring enormous benefit to businesses, consumers, uh, and domestic and global markets. Um, today's launch event is co-hosted by the CGCC Washington DC chapter. Uh, headquartered in New York, CGCC, as we saw in the video, has five regional chapters across the United States. Uh, and at this event, we want to thank our friends in DC uh, for their great support and collaboration. Um, now, I, I want to start off and begin um, by hearing from Mr. Tan Xu, uh, Vice Chairman of CGCC uh, and Chairman of CGCC DC and the President of China Telecom Americas. Um, Chairman Tan, Please. Uh, thank you, Peter. Dear CGC members, friends, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the premiere release of the CGCC USA 2020 Business Survey Report. Uh, I, I, as Peter just introduced, I'm, I'm the vice chair of CGCC. I'm uh, chairman of CGCC DC chapter and president of China Telecom Americas. On behalf of CGCC, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all member companies who participated in this year's survey. We also extend our sincere appreciation to PwC, uh, with whom we co collaborated again this year in developing this report, as well as many other individuals who support us during this process. To that end, a very special thanks to Ambassador Craig Allen, Mr. William Zerit, Mr. Ping Ni, and uh, Mr. Chris Money for joining us our panel today. We're, much, we're very much looking forward to hear your insights to the path forward for U.S.-China business relation. Uh, year 2020 marks the seventh consecutive years of CGCC business survey, as uh, highlighted by Peter just now, which in this report, we're gonna highlight both the challenges to and the uh, dynamism of Chinese business community in the United States. Like in previous years, all surveys started in February this year. Given the fast paced development of year 2020, we worked very hard to reflect the, la the latest mentality of our CGCC members. Uh, US-China relations are at a historical low, and there's no doubt about it. This year's survey reveals the CGCC members are at an inflection point. The dark perspective of schism between the world's two largest economies weighs heavily on business executives as they consider future growth strategy. About 78 of the respondents said they have been negatively impacted by the ongoing US-China diplomatic spat, with top challenges being supply chain management and cross-border personnel exchange, which you know, we're gonna just, uh, hear more insight from the panel later. At a time when business should be focused on helping the American economy recover from the pandemic, our members are increasingly preoccupied by the political brinkmanship that distracting us 
from serving our customer and creating jobs. However, this year's survey also showed incredible optimism and resilience on the part of Chinese, ent Chinese enterprise here in the US. Despite the merits of challenges, the US market remains a top priority for CGCC members, companies, investment, and extension interest. For, in for instance, over 95% of respondents assert they will continue operating in the US, while nearly 70% of them will stick to their previous investment plan. This commitment is further evidenced by the data recently published by US Department of Commerce. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, despite the deteriorating economic environment in year 2018 and the year 2019, Chinese company remains one of the fast growing source for FDI in US and accounted for a total investment of 59 billion US dollars. Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that Chinese companies care deeply about their local communities in the US. Many of our members have led donations efforts in their states and, and cities. Since this January, CGCC and its members have donated more than 3.8 million pieces of PPEs in the US. The Our Voices says American turning out to be the losing side of the US-China engagement, economic in engagement in the last four decades. If you take a, a real view of the, any major Chinese city, you will see neon signs of American brands from McDonald's, Hilton, Microsoft, to Disney, Apple, and Ford, blanketing the skyline. In comparison, the American market is still so barely pierced by Chinese companies that it is still sometimes making news headlines when a Chinese company buys ads in the Times Square. The steady improvement of US-China relations in the last four decades has brought tremendous opportunities for American business and workers. It has also introduced American culture and lifestyle to hundreds of millions of Chinese consumers. Business community in both countries understand the mutual beneficial and mutual dependent nature of US-China economic relations. In a year marked by uncertainty and tumult, this survey demonstrates how much we value our relationship with American consumers, labor force, and communities. We hope this report can give the public a unique view into the optimism and resilience that commonly define the Chinese and American entrepreneurs. Even though we have to remain physically distant, you know, by using webinar at this moment, we hope today's discussion can bring all of us even closer in our joint endeavor for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tan. Um, as Chairman Tan mentioned in the midst of this uh, very complicated environment, the data and information presented in this report have, have really become more relevant than ever before in assisting various stakeholders um, to really better understand the trends uh, and the local and national interests and benefits uh, the Chinese investments uh, have brought to the United States and really as an integral part of the overall bilateral business relationship. Um, I was happy to hear about the uh, CSR, the corporate social responsibility efforts uh, of Chinese companies. We have certainly participated in a great deal of that, um, but um, it, it really is a true testament to show um, how much Chinese companies really have uh, contributed, um, not only to uh, investments, but really to local communities. Um, so without further delay, um, I'd like to introduce Abby Lee. Uh, Abby is Director of Research and Analysis at CGCC, and she will give us a summary, uh, a slightly more detailed summary of the 2020 survey uh, report findings. Um, Abby, please. Abby? Sorry about that. All right, thank you, Peter. Chairman Tan, distinguished panel, panel guests, dear CGCC members and friends, good afternoon, and welcome to join us today. I'm Abby from CGCC, and I'm pleasure to walk you through the key findings of our business survey report this year. As Chairman Tan mentioned, 2020 marks the seventh consecutive year that CGCC conducts the annual business survey on Chinese enterprises in the United States. And it's the second year we partner with PwC on producing the report. We have witnessed the golden age of Chinese in investments in the US and feel keenly now, despite the ongoing disagreements and restrictions, 
that the relative health of U.S.-China relationship has a profound impact on the global economic landscape. Based on data collected from around 200 Chinese enterprises, our respondents' U.S. operations span a broad range of 11 industries and 25 subcategories in the global industry classification standard. With their headquarters located in 19 states and its subsidiary offices and facilities all across the country. Well, overall, the survey reflects that the Chinese companies hold substantial interest to invest in, this, in the U.S. economy, and when they do, their investment translates into job creation and economic growth. Their earnings are reinvested in the U.S. market, and their efforts to bond with local communities result in strong impacts as well. However, as trade between our two countries has been disrupted by the conflicts and the COVID-19 pandemic, our members' prospects of the U.S. business environment have become diverged. The survey this year indicates that 2019 marks a five-year downturn for both growth and profitability of Chinese companies. Revenue performance experienced a significant decrease over the past five years, partially due to more robust regulatory review in the U.S. and the rising geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China. There were over one-third of surveyed companies claimed a decrease of their revenue compared to the year before. We also observed that respondents are shifting their in, uh, investments to other regions while, while they hold off on investing further in the U.S. Drop of investments in the U.S. market therefore spells the fatigued performances of U.S. subsidiaries compared to parent companies' global operations. While the U.S. consumer may deem this an unfortunate set effect, um, respondents are, re are reducing expenditures, controlling costs, and improving their um, competitiveness, which may ultimately make them stronger on a global scale, while U.S. companies that are protected domestically lose their competitive edge abroad and eventually at home. While the complexity of U.S.-China relations remain the top systematic challenge when it comes to conducting business in the U.S., cultural differences between us or more specifically, a widespread tough stand against China, however, emerged as one of the top challenges this year. Well, similarly, in a mini survey we created to supplement the annual research, over 50% of the companies surveyed claimed that the anti-China rhetoric and the fraying between the two countries during the COVID-19 have adversely affected their operations, with 36% of the respondents noticed identifiable financial loss. As the U.S.-China relations is um, changing in fundamental ways, companies generally hold conservative views on its future directions. The ever-escalating decline in trade has caused a shadow over the development of most companies operating in the U.S. Some 78% of respondents reporting being actively impacted by the trade war in 2019. And during the height of the decline in trade relations, tariffs disrupted supply chains, created uncertain for firms and raised the costs for consumers. A fresh round of tariffs would be even more harmful. They would derail the fragile global re recovery and impose additional costs on the people in both countries as unemployment skyrockets and savings are drained by the economic consequences of the coronavirus. It would also further um, threaten the implementation of the phase one trade agreement. Um, in the current bilateral climate, Chinese companies are actively seeking strategies to ease or remit the, the associated risks of business operations in the U.S. Among a series of strategic responsive measures taken, innovation plays a considerable role to accurately predict and promptly respond to client demands at the local market. Top areas of innovation Chinese companies are pursuing, as we observed in the survey, are profit model, business process, and product performance. Despite these challenges, however, over two-thirds of surveyed respondents um, remain optimistic about the U.S. business and investment environment over the next two years. CGCC members are also consistent in their recognitions of the fundamental elements of the U.S. business um, system. 
So about 30% of surveyed companies are expecting their new business investment in the U.S. to increase, other than the opposite. Meanwhile, they are confident about the overall revenue performance over the next two years. Well, amidst uncertain and outlook for investment relations and somewhat lower EBIT for respondents in the U.S. versus globally, surveyed companies continue to invest in the U.S. This, uh, which shows that the U.S. market is seen as strategically important, um, even in the light of a neutral or negative trends in the current environment. While there can be uh, competitions and political dis uh, disputes between us, economic interdependence has proven to foster diplomatic cooperation, which in turn allows for further economic integration. Chinese enterprises in the U.S. are counting on both governments to promote business collaborations in the future. And CGCC will continue creating opportunities in growing Chinese investments and facilitating trusted Chinese brands in the U.S. We stand ready to support the business communities and the governments of both countries and they, as they embark on the next phase of this significant relationship. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to the unique insights and the company-level best practices from our panel later. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for that detailed summary. Uh, the report is available, um, and so I am going to start. Um, it certainly gives a certain sense of optimism, um, which I'm hoping uh, maybe we'll hear also from some of our panelists, uh, but we need to hear really what is going on on the ground. Um, I'm going to provide a brief backdrop to this panel discussion. Um, as we all know, US-China commercial ties expanded to really unimaginable levels over four decades. In 2018, China was in terms of goods, the largest US trading partner with a total trade at $660 billion, the third largest US export market at $120 billion and the largest source of US imports at $540 billion. Uh, this symbiotic trade relationship has made a vast array of consumer goods available to many Americans, and we have already seen how a trade war makes those goods actually much more expensive uh, and businesses really less efficient. Uh, if we've learned anything over the course of the last two years, uh, it is not realistic nor entirely in the interest of American consumers or businesses to bring various manufacturing back from overseas, and certainly not through countless protectionist policies and actions that are currently in place. Um, China has well established comparative advantages in terms of cost of labor, transportation, and infrastructure, in addition to a massive domestic market for goods produced by American companies uh, seeking additional share of the, of the Chinese market. Um, as of March 2020, CGCC member companies have invested over $123 billion in the US economy. Um, from a macroeconomic standpoint, we should recognize that such long-term foreign direct investment in our economy gives us greater resiliency, diversity, and opportunity, contributing real value to local communities, uh, as, as Mr. Tan really just mentioned as well. Um, it also improves uh, exports for American products and services. Um, these investments really should be valued and welcomed, um, and particularly in light of existing laws and regulations that they all must follow as they enter the United States and as operating in the United States. Both countries have maximized their growth by developing complementary economies, benefiting from their relative comparative advantages. Um, and they've created efficiencies for companies to go global, both American companies and Chinese companies. Um, while these investments are not insignificant in the US, their influence in the US is actually less impactful uh, as many might think especially when one considers the much larger volume of investments from Japan or other countries in the European Union. So um, what motivates Chinese companies going global and invest in the United States? Are supply chains and technology the main drivers for investing? Uh, and have these changed uh, in recent months and years? Um, further, how are Chinese companies and US companies for that matter navigating um, the United States-China relationship in the middle uh, of this historic uh, diplomatic and, and trade row. Um, these are all important questions that we're about to get into with our expert uh, panel of, uh, of experts um, that have really have spent uh, years, if not decades, uh, working uh, in China and out of China 
trying to find ways for positive and constructive engagement while balancing various risks and for that matter, national security concerns. Um, we are gonna leave some time uh, for Q&A at the end uh, of the presentation or panel discussion. I would ask that everybody use their Q&A feature uh, within the app uh, to pose your questions and we will certainly do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so with that, uh, Ambassador Craig Allen is the sixth president of the United States China Business Council, which is a private nonpartisan nonprofit organization representing over 200 American companies doing business with China. William Zarin is senior counselor at the Cohen Group, where he advises uh, both Western multinationals working in the Chinese commercial markets and helps Chinese companies navigate the U.S. business environment. Uh, he is currently vice chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in China and has served on the board chairman between 2017, has served as board chairman between 2017 and 2018. Mr. Ni Pinni is the president of Wanshang American Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Wanshang Group Company based in Hangzhou, China. Mr. Ni also serves as the executive vice president for Wanshang Group. Uh, and I think we're all very much looking forward to his perspectives um, as he's on the road now traveling to Ohio, as I understand. Uh, Chris Marlin is the founder and president of Lennar International, a division of North America's largest home builder, Lennar Corporation. He has been facilitating foreign direct investment in Lennar's U.S. real estate platform for many years. Um, I'm going to go into one final housekeeping point before we begin our questions uh, and panel discussion. Um, all of the views expressed here in today's events, uh, event by the speakers, including the moderator, of course, represent our own personal views and not necessarily the views of the organizations uh, we each represent and work for. So um, with that uh, backdrop, which I, I know was a lot, um, but I hope uh, really sets up uh, a good backdrop for everybody to begin this discussion, um, let us start off. Um, and I'm gonna start off really with Craig um, to answer the first question. Um, how do Chinese investors, Craig, uh, perceive the current U.S. investment climate and how are uh, cultural differences between the U.S. and China um, really as reflected in the survey we just heard impacting Chinese companies and or Chinese companies working with their American counterparts? Well, terrific, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I've been very much uh, looking forward to, uh, to the survey, uh, which does a very good job at uh, elucidating how our Chinese uh, investors are doing in the United States. And I would have to say it's kind of a glass half full, half empty type of thing. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised uh, that most Chinese investors in the United States are, seem to be doing very well. So just a couple of numbers uh, from the survey struck me as uh, very positive. Only 7% of uh, the Chinese uh, companies resident in the US were thinking of decreasing their investment. And 93% uh, were, uh, were going to stay in place. 95% uh, will, conti will continue to operate in the United States. Profits uh, seem pretty good, uh, albeit 25% uh, of Chinese companies invested in the United States saw their profits decline. But I, I doubt that that's much different from uh, native uh, American uh, companies. Um, so I was uh, very uh, pleased uh, to see that the huge majority of uh, Chinese investors in the United States, at least members of CGCC, seem to be doing uh, uh, well and are uh, going to be uh, expanding uh, in China, uh, in the United States. Um, I would uh, also say that uh, the glass half empty part is I could understand uh, why Chinese investors are nervous and uh, if we look at the rapid decline in Chinese foreign direct investment in the United States since uh, 2017, um, it indicates that all is not well. Uh, and 78% um, uh, of uh, CGCC members 
said that they have been affected by the trade dispute. That's a high number, uh, and uh, I very much regret uh, 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 our companies here that have been uh, uh, impacted uh, by, uh, if you will, geopolitical or, or political uh, discussions in between uh, the two countries. Um, but uh, so uh, while those who uh, Chinese companies who are here seem to be doing reasonably well, uh, I uh, also would be concerned about the future of Chinese investment. We would like more Chinese investment uh, in our country. We want uh, Chinese companies to employ Americans. We want Chinese uh, companies to contribute uh, to our society in myriad ways. And uh, thus, I would be uh, overly optimistic uh, if I said I was not concerned. Uh, I am concerned uh, about the future and hope uh, that we could uh, have a better report uh, and more Chinese investment next year. Thank you. Um, that's a great point. And I think that uh, I'm just sharing, making sure that everything is okay on the communication sure side. Sure that everything is okay. There's a slight yeah. echo. You got a little echo, yeah. Everything okay? Okay. Um, Craig, I, I share your concerns. I, and, and I think Chinese companies, uh, unfortunately, you know, they, they're, they're new to the United States and maybe um, have not experienced some of the election cycles that you and I and Bill and others have experienced. And so this year is, is even more challenging than, uh, than previous years. Um, Bill, you, you advise uh, both many U.S. Uh, and Chinese companies. Um, yeah. what's, your, what's your view on that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, very interesting. I was also pleasantly surprised at the overall message from the survey. Um, and I see it, you know, I'm very involved with the American Chamber of Commerce in China. So this is US company representatives based in China. And a lot of the results of your survey mirror what we see in China, and I find it very interesting. I find it overall general optimism, and yet uh, there are some areas of, of concern. The optimism, uh, one of the statistics that the US is still a top three investment destination for Chinese, the, the respondents to the survey, and that is the same uh, with AmCham China members, over 60%, China is still the top three. Um, in terms of companies that are either canceling, as um, Craig pointed out, only 7% Chinese firms here are considering leaving or canceling investment. But if we add those that are not increasing their investment, that's about 30%, which exactly mirrors what we see in American companies in China. And without belaboring this, I just, I find it so interesting to point out that the top challenges, we look at the top challenges, let's take the top three for, for Chinese companies working in the United States. And we see number one, complex US-China relations. I think that's a bit of a euphemism, but okay, complex US-China relations complicated and redundant regulations and opaqueness of relevant law enforcement. And if we, uh, if we turn that over to the US companies in China, we, cite, we see number one challenge, rising tensions in the bilateral relationship, inconsistent, unclear laws, and difficulty with regulatory compliance. So I think the similarities that both countries' companies are facing in each other's countries are more similar than different. And, and part of the question uh, based on culture, I think that uh, I had worked with a number of, of very strong, very good Chinese companies. So I had seen from the inside differences in approach to management and so forth. And we could go on on that uh, on that one uh, for a while, but I would just like to point out one of the challenges for more than a majority of Chinese companies here is lack of knowledge of relevant laws and regulations. 
And yes, the U.S. has complicated laws and each state's laws are different. But I think um, when we look at American companies in China, one of the first things they do is to really study the laws and the regulations. So it's a little bit different approach. And I would say if we, if we have to look at something that is cultural related, I would point to the approach of of the legal system in doing business. And I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting point, um, especially about the, the cultural issues and the cultural gaps. I mean, I certainly spend a good part uh, of my time uh, also uh, at the bank um, bridging the gaps. Our, our CEO is very focused on, on really creating a good environment for everybody to work together. Um, we saw some, uh, some of this play out in the movie American Factory. Um, and I think um, Mr. Nipian, um, who I hope is still on the line here, um, can really provide us, you know, given their operations in the U.S., uh, if he could provide uh, some perspective, um, both on the investment climate for them um, and also on the cultural issues. Uh, Nipian, he's on. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfectly. Yeah, so uh, I have to move my phone closer to myself, so I'm not going to be able to use the use the camera. I that's hope okay. that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. So, yeah. First of all, I would like to would uh, just echo what uh, Craig and the Bill were talking about. And uh, when I re read this one last night, I was uh, very happily surprised about this positive uh, attitude at least, uh, you know, the intention about keep investing in the United States, which is very good, you know, from this survey. However, on the other side, I would say that, uh, you know, for example, the survey say 70% of uh, Chinese company who already invest in the United States will stick to their, to its original plan. So it's almost isolated from uh, the current geopolitical battle. But on the other side, I would say, if you look back in the last few years, for the investment amount coming from China, which has dropped more than 90%, that does reflect what we have been experiencing in the Midwest and the talking with uh, other Chinese company who originally have the plan come to the United States. Now, I mean, I mean, those people are not here yet, so they're not going to be surveyed. So they're not in our data room. But those people, I think, their concern, their voice, their hesitation, and that they are drop out, you know, from uh, coming to the United States, I would say that's going to be more than 70% from at least my experience talking with a variety of Chinese company, because, you know, we have the CGCC chapter here as well. So that is a very, very big concern. And uh, so one side, you know, the soil is still here. The soil is still rich. That's a Chinese word, you know, it's a rich soil, so you can still grow. But on the other side, you know, the headwind is so strong that uh, we clearly see a lot of hesitation. So coming back to your culture uh, question, I think culture, you know, has to start from the mutual understanding. And uh, through this uh, pandemic, very clearly, you know, you have example about, about the culture difference. I'm using this mask, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, traveling today. Obviously, now we can see the mask is getting very popular, but at the beginning, uh, clearly it was a very difficult, you know, in our company, I remember at the beginning, we brought those masks here. I talked to several CEO of our manufacturing company. I said, guys, we got the mask here. Do you guys want it? They said, no, no, we don't want it. We're okay, you know. And then after a couple of months later, they say, oh, where's our mask? We need them. So anyway, uh, same, you know, so, so while the mask is difficult to, you know, to understand, except here, I mean, I, we, we were talking with uh, other people and they say, this is a little crazy. In China, you use your own chops to go to the dish. Everybody share together at the same time. Where's the common sense? That doesn't make any sense. It's going to be virus, you know, spreading and so forth and so on. But for Chinese people, that's an, that's very, very common. You know, if you don't do that, you're not even together for the, for the launch of dinner. So anyway, so I'm using that as an example to say, you know, culture is something that we have to understand each other. So that's the step one. Step two is that you have to really respect the difference. 
And uh, so we always say, you know, as a Chinese company coming to the United States, you have to understand that there's a law here, there's a rule here, there's a transparency requirement here. And uh, so, you know, you have to respect that, you have to obey the law, you have to follow the rule, you have to be transparent, and you have to learn how to work with the union and others. And it is very different, you know, the environment is very different, and uh, the history is very different, the custom is very different. So, you know, it's, it's actually to everybody's own best interest that uh, if you can be localized, I always say in the localization is this first step of the globalization. If you cannot localize yourself in each uh, country you go to, you will never be a globalized company. So localize, you know, to respect the local rule and the law, that is, uh, that is uh, you know, fundamentally important for Chinese company. And I think a lot of Chinese company got a lot of benefit by doing so because all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I have many examples. They build a very strong partners locally. The community like them. And, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about if you want to be a part of the community, you cannot be apart from the community. So right. that's the no, way, you know, I, yeah, that's the way you have to adapt yourself and uh, you have to be part of the community. I think, I think that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, I, don't, I don't think you, you don't see enough in the media or in the public, really, those types of community efforts and integration, you know, for Chinese companies. I mean, we, we, we at, at my institution, you know, have a, have a very broad CSR program. Um, and I know several other Chinese companies do as well, um, or many Chinese companies has really stepped up during the COVID crisis. Um, but again, only th those stories don't really get out enough. But I think that's a great point is that we really all have to be part of the community in which we operate, whether it's in China or whether it's in the US. Um, let me continue um, with you, um, Nipian, on another question that relates to supply chains. I mean, how, how significant is U.S. business collaboration with the Chinese firms, um, for example, in the area of supply chains and research and development? And has that changed at all, or do you expect that to change uh, in the near future? I would say definitely it's going to be more and more difficult, but I give you a, a very classic example. And uh, when the tariff issue started, we went to all the customers and say, hey guys, let's uh, find the alternative. Let's go to uh, Thailand, Vietnam, anywhere, you know, uh, try to build a, build a new facility. So now we can solve this uh, tariff issue. At that time, almost all the customers saying that, uh, no, no, we don't want to do that. I said, why? They say the tariff is a short-term issue. So we cannot do this just based on the geopolitical issue, which is uh, presumably at that time is going to be just only last uh, couple of years. They say we don't want to do that. So now more and more people are leaning to that. Although, you know, we still have, I would say, one third of a customer say, no, I don't want to do that. We say, why you don't want to do that? They say, if, we are, if I go to Thailand, go to other country, realistically for, you know, at least our industry, the cost is going to be a lot higher than from China. So while they want to cut it down those tariff, you know, which is 25% right now, but if going to Thailand, go to India, go to Mexico, go to other country, means a 15% or 10 to 15% higher, they only saving 10 to 15%. So they say for the 10 to 15%, do I want to go through this hassle to revalidate everything and the deal with, who knows, tomorrow maybe a tariff on the Thailand product. We have no certainty. If that's the case, you know, I would rather just stay, you know, no change. So this is a little surprising to see. However, on the other side, you know, so I did this, I call this the gravity issue, you know. At the end, uh, the product from China, given the supply chain capability in China, is still most competitive, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. So it's very difficult to do that. On the other side, you know, we do see a lot of, for example, you talk about technology. It used to be a serious issue. You cannot buy, you know, or have any influence, any investment as long as related to, with uh, sensitive technology. 
now we see a lot more, you know, concern whether you should hire Chinese uh, engineer or you should have uh, more people travel between U.S. China with uh, your computer, which is uh, which is uh, data on there. You know, a lot of time, you know, I talk to a few people. It, it isn't. There's nothing sensitive in the way it's uh, legally that's not allowed. It's just more of the hassle people don't want to take. And I, I talked to someone who got, who was on the airplane already, got it taken out from the airplane, took, his computer was taken away. He had to, you know, change his fly. He went to China, he lost his computer. He doesn't know what to do. At the end, he got the computer back. Everything's normal, nothing really wrong. Because uh, you know the 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 company he worked for you know even testified, so everything was fine. But those process itself, as long as it's not handled you know in in the most effective or efficient way, then it does cause a lot of trouble for people because of the inconvenience, because of the personal hassle. They say it's just not worth it. So we do yeah, see think, that has become more and more issue. I think that that is going to become more and more of an issue coming up. Um, Chris, I think you have, a, you have a perspective on this you'd like to share? Sure. I think in addition uh, to what we just heard, one of, the, one of the main issues that is going to come up with respect to R&D um, and, and the method and manner by which Chinese companies engage in R&D in the U.S. is this notion of, of what is trusted capital. Um, we've seen um, some, some changes to CFIUS already with respect to that. Um, for every Chinese company operating in the U.S. and focused on R&D efforts in the U.S., um, I would be watching that very carefully to see how that concept of what is trusted capital continues to evolve in the, in the context of the overall U.S.-China relationship construct. Um, but I would say with respect to supply chain, um, I was recruited very early on uh, in the early days of the pandemic as it was sweeping across the United States to work on our company's supply chain issues and disruptions that we were experiencing, frankly, from um, some point in January uh, through obviously the, the late part of the spring. And I was fairly surprised by how resilient uh, and rapid uh, workarounds could manifest themselves. And I also uh, was surprised by, and, and I probably shouldn't have been, but I also was surprised by the ways that Chinese companies acted so quickly to help with those workarounds, knowing that they were experiencing a temporary disruption, which would be then realigned with the global supply chain. And so I think there's a tendency right now, given the, the nature of US-China relations, to call everything some kind of national security matter. We all know that's just not true. Uh, and I think that certainly all of us have experienced in different ways, the, the ways that American and Chinese companies can continue to work together, even in this environment of tense dialogue, to solve these kinds of problems that will manifest themselves. Maybe it's a pandemic today, tomorrow it's going to be some other crisis, um, but we're all gonna be able to work together in a cooperative way, keep a dialogue, and come up with these temporary scenarios that will help us see the longer term success scenario. So uh, those are all very good points. And then the concept of trusted capital is something that we're starting to see a little bit more of as well. Um, Craig, I wanna turn back to you for a second. Um, in terms of the administration's China policy, um, and, and there's many of them, if you will, that, that we've all been struggling with over the last couple of years. Uh, in terms of, and we've seen how that's impacted certainly Chinese investment in the U.S. Um, but what is what is your take on how that's uh, impacted uh, both the investment and the trading? And let me caveat that with a statistic that I came across yesterday, which put China's trade surplus in July at roughly $32 billion, up from $29 billion last month. Um, but we've also seen um, and, and other issues relating to uh, cultural difference and visa programs. Um, these are all all creating some challenges here. Um, I, I also note that you came out, your organization came out with a survey yesterday, if you could touch upon, um, where I noticed you said, despite an unprecedented downturn in U.S.-China relations during the pandemic, U.S. businesses are not leaving the China market. 
Um, this seems to correlate with what we've been talking about, Chinese businesses committed to the US. So um, I know that's a lot to unpack there, but maybe you could share some of your insight on, on those issues. Sure, thank you, uh, Peter. The, the first thing I would uh, say is just to review uh, the US export numbers for 30 seconds, I think sets an important context. Uh, US exports uh, have declined about 24% uh, from uh, 2017 till today, the first uh, half of 2020. Um, and even though we have a phase one agreement, uh, which uh, includes uh, commitments by the Chinese side to uh, purchase significantly more American exports, U.S. exports are down in 2020, another 4.6%. So on the export side, uh, the rate of deterioration has slowed, uh, and we remain hopeful uh, that uh, the two governments and businesses are going to be able to meet uh, these demands. And I would, I would urge uh, uh, CGCC members, if you can export from the US to China, uh, you'll get credit for that. And it would be good business for you and it would be good for everybody. Um, so that uh, might help uh, some of the companies on this call. Um, uh, thank you for noting our survey. Uh, our survey was released yesterday. It is on our website. Um, and everyone is welcome to take a look at that. And as uh, Bill Zaret had mentioned, uh, uh, our survey uh, reflects very closely uh, the CGCC survey. American companies in China uh, feel look at the world very similarly to Chinese companies in America. Uh, it's quite fascinating, uh, the parallels. Um, let me just share the top five uh, findings uh, from our survey. Uh, number one is uh, that the phase one agreement signed by Lioja and President Trump on January 15th is very strongly supported uh, by our companies. Uh, although it's only been in effect since February 14th, uh, it's had a very positive uh, in impact and we want to build on that to really construct uh, a better relationship on this foundation. Um, secondly, uh, part of our surveys, like Chinese companies in America, American companies in China remain quite profitable uh, and commercially successful. And uh, our companies are not withdrawing from the Chinese market at all, uh, and neither are the Chinese companies withdrawing from America. And I think that that's uh, a positive trend. Uh, thirdly, uh, like uh, your members, our members uh, find the deteriorating bilateral relationship has dented our competitiveness uh, in China. Our members have had troubles with government procurement and uh, some supply chains and tariffs and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I, 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 in a manner quite similar to many of the people on this call. Um, another uh, factor that we saw uh, clearly is that uh, American companies are in China uh, for the China market, just as most Chinese companies are in America for the American market. And therefore, American companies are, are really not reshoring their supply chains back to the United States because you can't service China from the United States. Rather, they'll, they'll grow their operations in China to serve a growing uh, Chinese uh, market. And then uh, finally, um, American companies in China uh, feel that the playing field is not uh, level, uh, that when they compete against uh, state-owned enterprises uh, in China, that they're held to a different standard and uh, uh, have a more difficult time with government procurement and licensing and hiring and uh, pollution control and intellectual property rights and other areas. So the level playing field uh, remains uh, an uh, issue and rule of law remain an issue. 
Um, so overall, it's a very interesting contrast. Uh, and I invite you all uh, to look at our data, uh, uh, which I think you'll find surprisingly uh, looking very similar uh, to your data, uh, reflecting uh, reality on the ground uh, for Chinese companies in this country. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. And, and a lot of facts, lot of facts. I think, that are not uh, reflected in today's uh, media. Uh, or, or discussions, I think, uh, in public. Um, Bill, what's your, your, your take on that, if I can ask? Sure. Um, we've gone down the litany of, of policy changes, laws, executive orders that have um, seemed to really blunt our commercial relationship. And there's, there's no question about it. I just wanted to, to look at, at at the investment, and it was mentioned already, we peaked in 2016 with Chinese investment to the US over $50 billion, and then we went down precipitously. And I think we need to keep in mind that uh, there are, it, this is not happening in the vacuum of American policy. Uh, what has been going on on the China side at this same time? And we'll remember that there were uh, limitations on uh, um, outbound investment. There was a concern that the so-called hot money was leaving China too fast. And so the, the uh, authorities in China decided, OK, well, we're going to limit outbound investment. And that had a deleterious effect on investments in the US. And also, at the same time, there was a review in process on what kind of investments were, were going to be made with uh, Chinese companies in the US and other countries. And we see that the industry um, preference for the authorities was high tech, biotech, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, whether it's aerospace, new materials, things like that, which are now a part of China's strategy going forward. And so um, we saw a lot of the original investment was in real estate. And I know Chris is in that industry. And at that time when we saw this, this very quick reduction in Chinese investment, a lot of it was actually the authorities in China cajoling and convincing uh, Chinese companies to uh, sell their real estate investments and other investments in the US. So, you know, it's been a combination. I just want to point that out. It's been a combination of US policy and Chinese policy that has uh, brought us to this point where, what is it, $5 billion in Chinese investment in, uh, in the US last year, some $14 billion going in the other direction. Well, that's a good segue then into my next question, and, and, I, and I do want to leave time. We're at 2.55 right now. I want to leave time for questions, but I, so I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to kind of keep the, the next couple questions, uh, their comments brief. Um, what should be the next steps in improving U.S.-China investment relations in light of the Senate's passage uh, of the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act? And um, I'm going to throw in there again, briefly, but and I know Craig touched upon this uh, a little bit about the, the current uh, status of the phase one deal and further negotiations. But, but let me start off first with Chris on, on this question. Well, I, I think it's an un unfortunately named act, Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. Uh, look, uh, anyone who looks at the act uh, knows that it is a sledgehammer hammer focused on uh, Chinese companies listed in the United States. However, um, all U.S. companies have to deal with what we refer to as Peekaboo, um, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Um, all U.S. companies have to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley, from which this act was born. And I think it's a it, it's a nod toward this notion of quote level playing field uh, that Craig Allen. Uh, brought up earlier, which is the constant refrain that you hear from business community in the U.S., from the governmental uh, community in the U.S. as well. 
That said, to me, and I think to people who are looking at Chinese investment in the U.S., and frankly, all foreign investment in the U.S., not just Chinese, um, is these kinds of laws that target certain kinds of countries, certain kinds of actors in a way that may appear to others uh, to be discriminatory that call into question the notion of rule of law in the U.S. Uh, the last thing I think that the Securities Exchange Commission wants is to be in the middle of a geopolitical fight. Um, mm -hmm. The Securities Exchange Commission wants to do what it does, which is to enforce America's securities laws, which are in the nature of transparency um, and fair play. Um, that said, the principles of the law that relate to transparency and fair play, great. They should be applying to everyone anyway. Um, I think it's when our government gets over its skis a bit on notions of rule of law that we deter continued investment in the U.S. That is the reason why the United States continues to be the number one investment destination in real estate and an array of other investments around the world, bar none. The rule of law. Craig, um, what, what's your, I know you, talk, you touched briefly on phase one deal. Um, could you tell us where, where you see things or where are things right now? So um, I think that um, there will be a discussion or there is scheduled to be a discussion on Saturday between uh, yeah. Vice Premier Lioja and uh, USTR Robert Lighthizer uh, to evaluate the phase one agreement. I, from everything I'm hearing, um, they're going to agree that implementation is going reasonably well uh, and uh, that um, uh, the Chinese side has met its commitments uh, on, uh, with regard to changes of policy or law or regulation in China. Uh, and it, uh, indeed, uh, we would find that to be the case. There is another side of this uh, that is a little bit more complicated, uh, and that is that the, the Chinese side has agreed to purchase uh, or increase uh, imports of American products by uh, specific amounts. And this is a rather untraditional uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, because of COVID, because of the slowdown, uh, uh, because of global pricing and energy, uh, it's uh, going to be very difficult, uh, if not impossible, uh, for the uh, Chinese side uh, to meet its commitments, um, at least in the short term. And uh, so we'll see uh, where that goes with the negotiations. Um, I hope that uh, the trade and investment relationship remains a relatively quiet uh, part of the overall bigger relationship uh, because there are many other uh, geopolitical issues, uh, be it Hong Kong or South China Sea or Belt and Road or Taiwan or, and, and others uh, that, uh, that, that could make things much more complicated. Um, so uh, I am hopeful that we will continue uh, the phase one negotiations and in, uh, after the election, uh, can uh, engage in robust phase two negotiations, uh, which I would hope would bring some relief uh, to uh, Chinese investors in the United States or future Chinese investors in the United States. And I think that uh, how Chinese investors in the United States is a very good, are treated is a very good barometer uh, of the overall relationship. Uh, we want uh, you here. We want you to contribute. We want you to be profitable and uh, successful. We want you to grow. Uh, and uh, uh, we need uh, to ensure that uh, we have structures uh, that uh, allow that in a reciprocal uh, manner. Uh, and so I am cautiously optimistic uh, for the near term. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Craig. So I'm, I'm gonna ask at this point um, for Niepien actually to take out his crystal ball. Niepien, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, so, and I, I have the got, ball with me. You've got the ball with you? Um, yeah. Could you provide a forecast um, for short, medium, and, and long-term trade and, and investment relation, and really what are or should Chinese companies be doing 
uh, to prepare themselves for, for say the next six to 12 months? <laughs> First of all, we how's need that, to- How's that crystal ball now? <laughs> yeah, that, that ball turned into look at the election first. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna get to the election in my next question. In my in my yeah, last yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So 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 my view is uh, is uh, is that you know again I call this is a uh, gravity, and uh, there's no doubt working together you know for uh, bilateral investment or you know again I call serve and uh, solve. You need to serve the community and you need to solve the problem. So working together, you know, whether the U.S. Uh, company going to China, Chinese company coming here, definitely there's a, there's a, there's a, the gravity here pull us together. Now, the question is really for the policymaker, what do they want to do? You know, what is their determination? So I, I was joking. I say, if you want to have a balanced result, then you need to use a balanced approach. If you want a constructive result, then you cannot use a destructive approach. So I would say, you know, it's really the, the, the policymaker have to make a determination what do they really want. And I would say, you know, a, a balanced, constructive relationship will have both countries, no doubt. It but, already but Deeping, but Deeping, what do you, what do you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what do you say to the Chinese companies? What advice do you give them? given your experience here in the U.S. where we are now? Uh, I, yeah, I, I would say, you know, the fundamental, again, I'm coming from the West, okay? The fundamental has not changed. Although it's very frustrating, it's a very difficult, and you get a very lot of concern and pressure, but the fundamental has not changed. And again, you know, I was, taught, I was uh, with uh, Governor uh, Walker last Friday, we had a lunch together, and I was talking with uh, Senator Carper a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, I mean, again, everybody still like you as long as you hire more people, pay more tax, and, uh, you know, uh, give back to the community. And uh, if you're a good, good corporate citizen, and uh, you will be fine. So I would say this is the right time to you know, keep investing in the United States and uh, more of the investment will further bring the two countries together. Okay. Um, Bill, do you have an opinion on that? And um, what should yeah, China, sure. how do you advise Chinese companies? Yeah, let me, let me do that. Focusing on the six to 12 months and focusing on the short term here, I don't see uh, a big change in the trajectory. I think that the Chinese will continue to have outbound uh, investment controls and the U.S. will continue to scrutinize Chinese investments and this the, hopefully when I say trajectory of the U.S. China business relationship it's not going in a bad way but it's kind of just rolling along and that's what I expect to happen six to twelve months. Um, in terms of opportunities for Chinese companies uh, I would say that it's probably a very good time to look at investments in U.S. companies uh, that are not, not necessarily in high tech. For instance, those in the consumer, leisure, tourism industries, it would be a, a real opportune time for Chinese to help maintain some of these uh, companies that are facing a difficult time with the economic downturn due to the pandemic, and uh, to get involved and uh, be part of the community so investment in these companies is actually helping these companies. And in the medium term, probably the long short term, they'll be profitable. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna go into my last question, um, which uh, in a recent, in a recent uh, panel I took part in, my last question focused on who is gonna win the election um, and what that means uh, for US-China relations. I'm not going to put everybody on the spot in terms of their predictions for the election. However, we cannot get away from the fact that we do have an election season right now, and we are either going to have a Trump re-election um, um, or a Biden first term. Um, and I'm going to really pose this and ask you to be brief about it, but because um, I know we've touched on some of these points already, but if you were advising a Trump second term, um, or a Biden first term, 
um, if you can point to one or two things uh, maximum, what, what would you be advising? Because again, I want to get to some of the Q&A questions as well. Um, Craig, why don't we, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, why don't we start with you? Uh, okay, the hardest question. So it's never fun to go first on the hardest question. <laughs> the channel. Sorry um, to put you on the spot. But, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Look, I, I think I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but I'll inject some, some diversity of, of thought here. Um, first and foremost, to either administration, uh, recalibrate uh, policy to rule of law status quo. Um, that is the most powerful uh, investment security advice that can be given uh, to any administration because it, it is the thing that makes the United States the most attractive destination for foreign investment on a global basis. Number two, amp up people to people exchanges, amp up corporate dialogues, people to people dialogues, engagement and cooperation, channels and alternatives, convenings just like this and ratchet down the rhetoric. You can still have differences and productive differences and you can still productively challenge those differences and obtain common ground while you're letting people to people opportunities and business to business opportunities develop to strengthen the bonds between your people and not driving a wedge between them. That would be my advice. Okay, Bill? Yeah, sure. Uh, I actually tried to give some advice back in 2017. I, I had an article in the South China Morning Post, which I'm sure you all memorized by now. Um, it was about a new grand bargain. And the fact that both countries have really benefited up till now in the relationship, but for a number of different reasons, some we've talked about today, we need to recalibrate. And it's, it, there are benefits to be had. You know, both countries believe that their respective economic systems are best for them. So they're not gonna be changing any time in the near future. So we need to have a mechanism to mitigate that. We're only gonna get it if we talk, as, as Chris, um, mentioned, we have to talk and we have to talk at high levels. And one thing I would just add, uh, in, in addition to really at this point and over the next number of years, we need statesmanship um, in order to find a way to mitigate the differences. And um, we, the U.S. needs to, and I think we've learned this over the years, we need to still have some kind of leverage and not be afraid to use it in order to actually have successful negotiations with our Chinese friends. And I'll stop there. Okay. Nizol, uh, Nipian, um, I'm gonna ask you, uh, and then we'll follow with Craig on this question. How would you advise uh, the next administration, regardless of party? Yeah, so uh, mine Please, is pretty simple. Because, uh, we're yeah, running yeah, out of time. Very, yeah. Uh, let the business be the business. And uh, all those other things, uh, geopolitical or whatever, they're too heavy for business to carry. And this is not the burden business can afford, neither the business should afford. So let the business be business and uh, let the business become the stabilizer for the relationship. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Craig, you're, you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Craig? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I, I would say, uh, in short, that uh, both countries are members of the WTO and both have legal commitments. Uh, I resonate with Chris very much on rule of law, uh, that both countries could do a better job uh, at meeting their WTO commitments. Now, there are some times when the WTO is silent, uh, and if the WTO does not speak, uh, to something, reciprocity is not a bad uh, way to structure the, the relationship. But we have to keep uh, national security concerns uh, in perspective. Uh, not everything is a national security emergency. Uh, and we should uh, uh, be careful on both sides uh, not to use uh, national security as an excuse uh, for taking protectionist uh, actions. And I see that in Beijing, and I see it in Washington, 
uh, and it's a uh, it, it, it's a very negative trend uh, that we need to uh, defend ourselves uh, against. So, in short, I would say rule of law, uh, WTO commitments uh, whenever possible, and reciprocity when that is not possible. And uh, uh, we should uh, work on uh, building up mutual trust, uh, which is at a historic low right now. Uh, and I think everyone on this call has a responsibility there to uh, help uh, building up that trust. Uh, and it's certainly something that uh, we can uh, achieve uh, together. Thank you. I think that those are all very, very good points. Um, I wanna, I'm gonna shift real quickly just to some quick questions. Um, and I'm gonna start off actually by apologizing to the group. Um, I, I can imagine my panelists uh, can guess um, there, there are several questions that relate to TikTok. Um, it is something that we will not be able to, it's a much broader and longer discussion, um, but I do, uh, my understanding is that CGCC will, uh, in, in one of its subsequent webinars, will have a more detailed discussion on the uh, TikTok and, and WeChat uh, issues. Um, but one question that, that we've sort of touched upon here for the next uh, election, um, one question comes up is, are things going to get worse, um, or get better, uh, slowly, quickly? Um, we've seen it before in other election cycles. They, things have recovered after six months. Um, Bill, what do you think? You're in DC. What do you think is gonna, how much, how much time, regardless of who gets elected, do you think it'll take for relations to, uh, to recover? Well, we've already oh, seen see. a lot of policies, oh, okay. a lot of actions by the US that uh, we never expected. And I think we're gonna keep seeing them up until election day. And frankly, personally, I think a lot of them are politically motivated. And then there's the, the period between what we call the lame duck period, if indeed there is a change of administration. And I think we need to uh, buckle our seat belts and have on our helmets during those couple months. Uh, and um, I, f I don't see anything really good happening even if there is a change in administration in terms of the, the bilateral relationship, until the dust settles um, on a new relationship or a, a new administration. Uh, and if it's not a new administration, continuation of the present administration, I also think that a lot of the more politically motivated moves by the US uh, may be moderated. And uh, I, so I'm optimistic on both ends, maybe, in, in a year or so. Craig, would you agree, disagree? And... No, I think uh, that Bill has that uh, exactly uh, right. Um, I would agree that between now and the election, uh, I would expect the unexpected. Uh, in, uh, after from the election to a transition, uh, it depends. Uh, the other factor that we really that will really be very important for the longer term of the relationship is the Senate. Um, the relationship between the Congress and the White House is such that the Congress is pushing the White House uh, to become stricter on China. And uh, if there is a change um, in the Senate and the uh, and if uh, and in the White House at the same time. And if the Democrats control all three, uh, uh, the Senate, the White House, and, and, and uh, the Congress, then uh, I think we have a very different ball game. Um, so uh, we won't really know uh, until the evening of November 3 or November 4, uh, how that will be. Um, so um, in the meantime, I, I like uh, uh, Bill's uh, safety tip. Uh, buckle your seatbelts and, and strap <laughs> on your helmet. Thank you. I, I, I keep using that line myself for, for my conversations. Anyway, that's certainly a, an enormous amount of information for us to unpack in today's panel. Um, I really want to thank um, all the panelists for sharing their experiences and even sharing some sense of optimism as we navigate these really difficult and unprecedented times. Um, I hope the insights and perspectives drawn from the discussion will spark um, some additional and uh, open and candid communications um, on both sides. Uh, 2020 will be a critical year for businesses and policymakers, and 
uh, will likely also see the impact and the trajectory of where U.S.-China relations uh, is going to go. Um, I'd like to conclude with uh, some quick remarks um, by saying that CGCC is committed to facilitating cooperation, building trust, and represents the interests of its members um, as they expand their operations and investments in the U.S. Um, together, I'm confident we can seek a brighter future by increasing the level of mutual understanding, by leveraging our strengths and overcoming our weaknesses, uh, and we really respecting the differences in culture and even economic systems uh, in an effort to seek compromise and opportunities to build upon the successes we really have achieved over the last 40 years. Um, make no mistake, though, the world benefits from a stable U.S.-China relationship, uh, and in light of the current economic crisis, in my opinion, uh, cooperation and collaboration is really the only way that we could resolve um, both these issues and other major global challenges that we're facing. Um, so with that, I just want to uh, mention real quickly some upcoming events um, for CGCC. Uh, we hope that you all can attend as well. CGCC and the CGCC Foundation have launched their annual Experience 2020 Photo Contest. Uh, the contest runs from August 5th to November 23rd, uh, and it really aims to showcase the individual and collective experiences of Chinese and American business communities um, working together throughout 2020. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, pictures, um, really, that will show how good, how the people-to-people -people relationship uh, is, is going these days. Um, photographers from all levels are welcome. Um, I'm sure many of you have pictures on your cell phones, um, so please don't be sure about shine. Uh, don't be shy about sharing them in the contest. Um, on August 17th, which is next Monday, CGCC and Hunt and Andrews Perth are hosting a webinar uh, on risk controls of Chinese companies in the US under the current Sino-US relationship. Um, it's gonna to touch upon regulatory compliance management guidelines for Chinese companies um, and uh, advice and, and uh, sort of an overview will be provided by the experts from the law firm. Um, with that, um, we're a little bit over time, um, but really I think today's discussion was very um, substantive um, with really good insight, uh, incredible insight by all of our panelists. Um, and I, I thank them for their time, um, for sharing their experiences. Uh, I'm sure they will make themselves available to anyone um, who has further questions. Um, but really I wanna thank everybody uh, on the panel. I wanna thank again Washington, CGCC Washington DC uh, CGCC National, of course, uh, and really uh, thank you all, and we look forward to uh, seeing you the next time. So have a great day. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.